All right. Thanks, Jonas. And now let me find Rita on this list again. Here we go. And handing off. All right. So we have a few things to do tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I want to congratulate everybody who uh, was in the OSA show, the Oregon Society of Artists, especially those who won awards. It was a really great show. It's still up for a little while, and I recommend going to check it out. There's a lot of great photography there, not only by our members, by other people as well. Uh, we're going to do a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to do the monthly challenge. So let's start off. Joe, you had uh, an announcement you wanted to make. So, right. So we'll have the uh, first uh, Sunday school session of the year coming up on Sunday, April 23rd. Um, I have some folks that have expressed interest, uh, but I still need um, contact information for you. I still need to know where you're going to show up. So we'll know not to wait for you or to wait for you if that's the case. Um, and you need to remember to bring your liability forms. So it's going to be waterfalls out in the Columbia River Gorge, and hopefully it will be too terribly wet for the rain part. Um, and Mark's going to be doing a uh, program in May at the Hot Rod Show, and so the, he'll be posting that up pretty soon. And yep. then we have no one volunteered at all, so we need things for like June, July, August, September, you know, so um, you've had a chance to think about it. So, um, you know, please volunteer. It's just probably if you just do one a year, that would be really great. And then we can have a lot of really fun things to do. And we definitely want to hit the, those months with the nice weather. Yeah. I'll, be sending, I'll be sending out an email this week with a reminder uh, about those two events and also a reminder if people want to lead a Sunday school, uh, how they can contact you, Joe. So keep your eyes out for that later this week. Anything else, Joe? Is that it? Nope, that's it. All right. And uh, Bob, you wanted to talk about uh, a school? I mean, a, a OSA uh, show? Or yeah, class? there's a, there's a, uh, a workshop at, at OSA uh, by, led by David Cobb, who lives out in Mosier. Uh, he will be uh, having a workshop on garden photography. Uh, we will start at OSA and then we'll have an outing to the Rose Garden and an outing to Crystal, Crystal Springs Rhododendron Garden. Uh, and so that's on the uh, OSA website. And so that's Saturday and Sunday, May 6th and 7th. And uh, our own Don Jacobson will be leading a wildflower photography workshop out of OSA uh, in July, and that's also on the OSA website. I believe it's uh, the 20 something of, of July. Okay, great. All right. Uh, do any other board members have announcements they want to make? Okay, looks good. All right, so we're going to start moving along. So, uh, Bob is the person who's been running the monthly challenge, he's the one who comes up with the ideas and everything. And so this month, he's going to show the monthly challenge slideshow. So, Bob, just uh, share your screen when you're ready to go.
Well done, everyone. That was a great group of images. And thanks for uh, submitting. Bob, what's next month? You want to tell us about that a little bit? Uh, next month's theme will be interesting people. So any people that you take photos of that you think are interesting subjects. Uh, and thanks everybody who submitted for, for this month's uh, uh, challenge. And the photo challenge is a members only thing. Just a reminder, uh, PPF does lots of great events. And if you're not already a member, I think most people here are, but if you're not, think about joining. Your money goes to supporting all the different programs that we do. Okay, uh, Randy, you did want to make a quick announcement. Yes, um, uh, Mark recommended to me to go to HD Aluminum. Uh, they do metal printing of photographs. If you haven't already heard of them, I'd recommend them so highly. They're in Vancouver and I don't live close, but it was definitely worth the trip. Um, they, from the very start, when I had um, a photograph and then a poem I wanted printed on top of the photograph on metal, from the very start to the very end, they went out of their way to help me. I was totally new to the process. Um, they uh, allow you to see test prints in the beginning and you know several different finishes that you can have. And um, yeah, they, <laughs> I had asked them to um, let me see it before they sent it out on a rush for me as a present for somebody. And, you know, so good at sending it on a rush. They didn't show it to me in advance and which was nothing. I mean, that was zero. And yet they made a whole new print for me and sent it to me for free. I mean, I just, can't recommend them enough. Yeah. Good. Glad you had a good experience. Yeah, they're right over in Vancouver. If you're into metal printing that's a, and you're local here, that's a great place to try. Okay. Uh, so, I, Mark, I'll, I'll I, add yes. to that. Um, you can actually send your file, your image file to them. Mm -hmm. And if you're an Oregon resident, um, they will actually meet you in the back lot of uh, Pro Photo. And that way you can avoid paying the uh, the sales tax thing. So yeah, they're they're mm -hmm. pretty amazing folks. And if you have something that really needs to pop and be visible, yeah, uh, there it's it's gorgeous stuff. So yeah, Joe, metal... uh, Joe, I wanted to ask you. You had several uh, metal prints in the OSA PBF show. Is that where you had them done? They were both HD aluminum. Yeah, those were beautiful. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and keep moving on since we still. Uh, we have Phil Bowser coming up, who's going to do a 15-minute program on some of the images that he's been working on. Uh, Phil, are you ready to go to share your screen? I am. Okay. And there you are. Is this stuff that's in the blue sky drawers, or what are we looking at? Uh, this is recent work. Okay, awesome. I'll mute myself and let you go. All right. Is that coming through? Yes. All right. So let's see if I can get it better centered there. All righty. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for giving me a chance to share what I've been up to lately. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I came up into uh, photography the way everybody else did. I think my dad gave me a plastic Kodak brownie and he said, don't drop it. It's fragile. It'll bust. And of course, I immediately dropped it. Uh, but eventually I figured out how to make pictures, but about my first 10,000 prints were, were all my mother in front of something waving, and I always had to be back about, uh, you know, two or three football fields to get everything in, but that's kind of where I've been. This particular series here uh, got started when I found myself being sort of disappointed with uh, my usual uh, uh, at landscapes and street photography and stuff, and it just just didn't feel right. And it occurred to me that uh, I, I was not showing much of my current state in the pictures at the time. I was I was showing a pretty uh, superficial layer, adding beauty to the scene that I'd run into. 
but it it did not really match what I was uh, feeling about it. Uh, you may have recalled the uh, uh, garden in the pandemic moonlight print that I made at the beginning of the pandemic, where it was a nighttime shot and everything was kind of jittery and nervous and spooky. And so I thought I'd go back and, and revisit that sort of thing. Uh, this is the guy here that got me thinking that I needed to put more of myself in it. That's Rene Burry. He was a Magnum photographer, uh, but basically he said that uh, if you can put some of your own intensity into it, he thinks that makes a better picture. And so that's what I was shooting for. Uh, Phil? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but we're not, we're just seeing your thumbnails. We're not seeing the whole picture on oh, the screen. When I do that, you don't pop up? No. That's interesting. I wonder how I can, well, let's see what we can do about that. When you shared your screen, did you share your whole screen or did you just share a portion of it? I, I shared this page right here. Okay. And so when you enlarge things, do they pop up on a, in a different window? Yes, they do. Okay. So maybe that's why we're not seeing it. Maybe that's it. I'll just enlarge them okay. here. Can you All see right. the double X? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to very quickly go through a bunch of the shots. Uh, they all started with just a plain uh, photograph, and then I just went crazy uh, applying different filters and techniques to try and strip off that surface layer and give a suggestion that uh, we were showing stuff that was uh, not usually seen. Um, so this is uh, obviously rulers that I've... Uh, fiddled with. This one here, uh, same kind of thing. You can see I'm, I'm really throwing away a lot of the classic rules of photography. Um, I'm sometimes enlarging them to the point where individual pixels show, um, adding false colors and, and textures. This one's a little less, less wild. But all trying to give the impression that, yeah, that's an ordinary scene, but there's a lot of things going on behind closed doors, behind the curtain. Bill, do you want us to wait for questions at the end or um, as they come to our feeble, feeble minds? If you got questions, just go for it. Um, how do you title these images? Uh, well, the part of pictures, uh, we're all there to, to let people know that I'm not intending this to be the whole scene. So like part of aviary, there's, there's a whole lot more to that uh, picture of the bird than what I'm actually revealing. I'm just taking a, a very, very small chunk out of the, out of the frame. And also the, Part of aviary is the undercover mullings and operations uh, that we're not aware of. I think this all kind of came out of uh, my awareness that a lot of the systems that were tested by the um, pandemic uh, wound up failing. And we thought we had a great system for dealing with pandemics, but no, we didn't. And we thought our health system was going to handle it, and no, they didn't. And we thought the CDC was going to give us clear guidance, and no, they didn't. And the money system and the system of uh, transporting goods to market, the supply chain and all that, just all of these things were failing. But what we were seeing was happy, smiling faces on the TV. So uh, I ran into an article by a fellow who actually said that he thought that photography was complicit in showing beautiful images when so many things were wrong. And uh, the beautiful images help to support the power structures uh, need for people to remain calm and do what they're told to do. But if you looked at what was below the surface, you might be actually upset about what was happening. So here's uh, what I wound up doing with the gladiolas. I don't know if it's going to 
survive much in the way of uh, magnification. That's as far as we can go, going this way. I found that I tended to work very quickly. I really got into the zone in a hurry. I could work two hours and just lose total track of the time. And that was real good for maintaining my mood. If I could get to Photoshop and uh, tear some of these uh, otherwise ordinary photos apart, deconstruct them, that uh, that seemed to help me reduce my anxiety and stuff. So, uh, Phil, could you, like on that one, I, that's quite beautiful. Um, how Can you deconstruct that for us in terms of how you created that? Sure. Well, well one of the first steps is to take a piece of the bigger and to blow it up like crazy. And in this case, uh, I made a mirror image out of it. And then I went through and uh, in Photoshop, I dialed down the exposure to almost zero and then brought it back with all the other uh, uh, controls in Photoshop. So a lot of these tend to have a, a compressed uh, dynamic range. And then I added uh, textures and uh, copied pieces from copied pieces from here to there to break up uh, smooth lines and hmm. just just trying to uh, suggest that chaos is happening mm -hmm. hmm. uh, I guess I'd have to actually see it maybe you can do a workshop sometime on this process. sure sure we could probably do that a lot of it is just uh, almost unconsciously you know grabbing a control and throwing it left and right as far as you can. And somewhere in the mm -hmm. middle, you see a spot where you go, oh, I like that part. Yeah. Then oh. you can mask out the stuff you don't like or selectively sharpen this over that. Or... This is one of the early ones. Uh, you might be able to make out clock faces there. So on, on the right here, you've got some hands and a dial, and there's another clock face over here. This is actually a just a uh, shot of people walking on the beach. This is one where I uh, was wondering if maybe I was hiding the image too much and people wouldn't get it at all. It would be too much work to figure out what was going on. So I tried to dial down some of the chaos a bit. Same here. Trying to make it just, you know, real obvious what I started with. This one here is a photographer who uh, realized that he had uh, over 30,000 uh, rolls of film that he hadn't printed yet. <laughs> and so he decided maybe he ought to start organizing his life's work. And so all of those yellow boxes, of course, are Kodak paper boxes. And that's just a small chunk of this wall of boxes with the prints he's been making. I was kind of impressed by his determination to put order into things. And then, of course, I had to go in and, and tear the order apart. So, Phil, just so you know, you have five minutes left. Oh, it's going by pretty quickly. Okay. Always does. Yeah. So there's another one. This one's in a show online. Uh, this is a fairly recent. First slide of spring, part of broken. So I had a whole series of broken things that I took pictures of and then I adjusted them. And I played with uh, copying and pasting sections of uh, borders and other places where you wouldn't expect them. It's kind of like in The Wizard of Oz where that guy comes out and says, do not pay attention to the little man behind the curtain. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to show you the little man behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing here is um, 
all the papers that I didn't need anymore when I did my taxes run through the uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see big enough that there's mm -hmm. yeah I don't know why it's not coming with me Green seems like it's not common. There you go. Yeah. Crocus cluster. This is just a flower that a little girl in my neighborhood dropped on the sidewalk. Hmm. Looking out my window. Hmm. That's a little less wild. That's, um, that's my son, who's currently in his 40s when he was brand new. This is a self-portrait featuring my heart zone on my left side, and it's superimposed with uh, rough draft notes by uh, Octavia Butler on a poem that she was doing. So I think we've covered that. If I can... Wow, those are just so... Beautiful and creative, Phil. Yeah, it's a really interesting group. And you're doing most of that uh, deconstruction in Photoshop? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here, here's John Tagg, Burden of Representation, where he was talking about uh, beautiful ph photography uh, being complicit. And a lot of people have assumptions about what they're looking at based by the culture they came from. So in the early days when people were trying to classify different species, it varied how we took pictures of them on what we thought about uh, the different kinds of people we were photographing. And this is uh, James Baldwin, who said that the role of the artist is to illuminate the darkness, blaze roads through the forest, so we will not, in all of our doing, lose sight of our purpose which is to make the world a more humane dwelling place. So those were some of the remember. that led me that way. Uh, if you see anything you like, I'm always into trading prints. If you know somebody that wants to buy one, of course, send them my way. But uh, that's a quick run through there of uh, what I've been doing lately. Thank you for letting me uh, take up your time here. Well, thanks for sharing. That was inspiring. It's a really nice group. Yeah, so uh, programs committee, there's another workshop right there in the making that I would definitely <laughs> sign up for. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Okay, so it's time for our main event. So uh, Bob Bertram is going to introduce Christian. He, Christian, you have until uh, you have an hour and then we'll that'll leave about 20 minutes for questions. If there aren't many questions, you can go, this meeting ends at nine, so you can go as close to that as you would like to go. Okay, I wanted to thank Christian for coming to speak with us tonight. Christian is coming from Baja, Mexico. Uh, Christian is a, a Swiss-born photographer who uh, lives most of the year in Bend, Oregon. He was originally trained as an architect, but 30 years ago made a career change to become a travel photographer. Uh, his photography work has been published in over 200 coffee table books, uh, numerous magazine articles, uh, including this uh, current edition of the German magazine, uh, America Journal. Um, Christian runs uh, photography workshops all over the world, but especially in the Western United States. Uh, he says that when he was growing up in Switzerland, he dreamed of coming to America and meeting cowboys and Indians. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, cr most of Christian's work, uh, of course, is landscape and cityscape and nature photography. But he has done several uh, artistic photography series, including the one he's going to share with us tonight, the American Dreamscapes. Uh, which kind of along Phil's theme maybe uh, is more social commentary uh, from a different point of view, uh, more a la Pulp Fiction. Uh, 
or the uh, underbelly of America. He also, if you look at his website, has an interesting series, uh, Tongue in Cheek of Uncle Sam. And he has some very beautiful, inspiring portraits of Native Americans. Uh, so, uh, Christian, thank you very much for, for being with us tonight and for sharing your American dreamscapes. It looks like you're muted, Christian. I just see that. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for doing this. So I probably go to share screen, eh? Mm-hmm. Here we go. Let's see. Then okay. Well, I think it's already all been said. So uh, the only thing I would have to add is that I actually came to the States to photograph Native Americans and not cowboys. So that's the only <laughs> <laughs> So I ended up photographing cowboys, but I came in 86 with the main purpose to take pictures of Native Americans, kind of like this photo. So we aren't seeing your screen. Did you share your screen? I think I did. You don't? Mm -mm. Uh, oh. Okay, let's see. Zoom. When you click on share screen, it asks yeah. you what you want to share. Uh, thank you. There we go. Share. It looks like it. There we go. Good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Otherwise, you keep talking and you don't see it. <laughs> so, as far as it's full screen, right? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right. So, uh, Christian, if you hit the uh, the double ended arrow in the upper right corner, it will make it a full screen image. I was trying to. Uh, next to where it says one to one. Yeah, screen sharing, stop share. Jesus. No, uh, just so the left, go, go of left of that. Left, left, left. 26%. Then there's a plus sign and a negative sign and then one to one and then the arrow. So yeah, there usually, might be something blocking that. Oh, that's, okay. what, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Go was, keep going left. Go keep left. going left a little bit. This seems to not really amusing. I, 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 I had it, but I don't. Let's see. Well, I should there. Go back up. That's it. That's weird. I'm going to ask for remote control. If you want to give that to me, I can click on it. Approved. Oops. And now we're not seeing the same thing. Just jump to a different screen. Welcome back to. Yes. There we go. Oh, click that. I'm signing. Turn it on this. Uh, we just want to close that. And now get back to your show again, where you were. Which was here. This is it. I don't know. I'm asking where I went. Kind of, you might see. Which show? Let's go back to here. That was before the clip here. The double click. Oh, no. Uh, Do you need to hit the back arrow over on the left? Is it in one of these albums here? Is this where you're looking at it or? Yeah, this is the album. So I actually have to open with photos. It's open with photos. That should do it. That's what we were. There we go. But I don't know why now I can make it without that top bar. Okay, we're seeing something that says introducing Microsoft Chim mm -hmm. Clip Champ. Okay. So right. maybe you want to say maybe later on that? Yep, which I did. Okay, it looks right. like you're getting this. Let's still we go. Here we go. Now it's this is Photoshop. I don't like that. And that him only that. Okay. There we go. Looks like you're on the Microsoft cloud. Right. Windows cameras. Okay, 
So we lost that's your the, share. That's the third. That's why we don't have to go. Well, I'll go back to share screen. Okay. Oh, is the All right. So why don't we just leave it this way? I don't think we need to go full screen. Okay. Yeah, because I don't. It, it, it's funny with the was there, but now it's not. Uh, yeah, I think these look great. It's big enough. Yeah, but it's it's something now. There we go. Yeah, I guess it's the size we have, right? Okay. So, all right. Yeah, looks good. So I figured you'd just ask questions. Do you have any? Even bring the photos. So basically, uh, as we've already you're in for the state of the It's not perfect. Um, mm -hmm. From the travel photography subject that we did for like 20 years, we're shooting a lot of work back to all the beautiful scenes and all the um, different countries all over the world. In 20 years, of doing that, we kind of started the studio in Bend, Oregon, which you may be familiar or not. So the Cascade Center of Photography 2011, when we bought a property there. So I suddenly had a photo studio, which I had no clue how to work portraits in a photo studio. So I started to photograph people and try to find my bearings um, just to do portraits and things. So the whole thing with the American Dreams got started with uh, this woman uh, who was the girlfriend of uh, Tony from Ponyard, uh, beer in Bend. He said, why don't you just take some photos of her? She likes taking photos or being photographed. So I took photos of her uh, to find out about lighting and do more portraits than I was doing in my travel stuff. And, and that thing, I would try to fumble with all these things that every person that does the senior parts of the thing. So I had to figure all that stuff out because I never used it. So I started uh, basically just doing these stupid photographs and I realized that it's not very interesting just to photograph uh, pretty girls or people. It's, it's actually, you know, just pretty boring. So I started to create images with them. It's, kind of like, it, it's all around them. And I tried to, you know, do some good lighting and uh, with lighting. And it, that got me kind of boring. Once you figure it out, um, it gets kind of bland. So I started to create stories about America and the country I moved to, which got weirder the longer I lived there. Because you have this vision of a place when you live in Europe. Um, in a foreign country, you have these ideas about what America is, but then once you actually live there, um, you see all these things that you can realize. Um, Edward Hopkins was always one of my favorite painters, obviously, for a long time ago. And um, so I've started to create scenes like this, which I tried for a long time, but I never had really the time to actually do it. It was mainly shooting for magazines, shooting for books, and never had the time to create things. So this Austin, Texas, I found a lot of the places kind of like, probably like how I painted, paint it, uh, pretty lonely. American cities are pretty drab, really. They're not livable places. Maybe Portland is a little different, or it used to be. Um, so I just sent some scenes. This is actually the German writer that was with me on an assignment. And just buy my house in Mexico, obviously, to be in the American South, especially with a lot of Mexican culture in the US. Just kind of strobe lighting, just in Ben Oregon. Um, one of the bars I was shooting the bar for a magazine to kind of for like the best places in Ben to do whatever. So I finally went back there and staged it with some people. I uh, tried to figure out what I want to do with all this. This was like painted with flashlights, and I just used like one stroke for the girl. And a lot of the images, kind of, uh, there's always a gun somewhere, which seemed to be like, very American. Again, the loneliness was done in Ben, the kind of, it's more like a Los Angeles scene, but it's on, uh, on Ben. But I, 
It took me at the beginning, it took me like two hours to figure this thing out and get this photo because I had no clue about lighting. And at the end of the project, like I for five years was doing American Dreamscape. So usually it took me like an hour to set it all up, and sometimes up to six ropes or some Nikon flash along with them. And um, we would get so professional, we'd come in and we shoot it in an hour and it's done with models and people that we uh, had. This is Navajos down in Arizona. I was still doing some travel things, still doing books on Arizona and those kind of things. And in between, I would shoot some scenes like this. Some were very simple and basic. Some were kind of more uh, a little more elaborate. This one was done with the flashlight still because I it was too way to walk with all these ropes. All the, all the people are basically people I found somewhere. I mean, they're not professional models or anything. It's like Rick Steber. I'm not familiar with him as Brian Bill. This a writer who writes all these Western books. And the girl there, the, the tattooed girl, was basically, she was actually assisting a photo shoot and we did a fashion thing for the source of the event. So I, I asked her, and I found out that everybody likes being photographed. <laughs> and that was kind of the key image here that got me into actually doing this series I called American Dreamscapes. And it was this one was done with an assist, I had an assistant in that was running the studio band, and he was doing like the workshop, people signing up for books and all that. So he was an office manager. So I shot with him and another guy helping. Well, we actually used a lot of strobe lights and posed them really well and all that. And when I got this photo, I knew, okay, I think I figured it out, but it took me a while. So on a lot of these concepts, are you sort of constructing the concept and then looking for people or do you meet people and they sort yeah. of reveal the concept? Um, some of it, I had like this idea in my head that I was well, looking for specific people for it. And often I would just walk into a place and I see somebody and I would say this person's perfect. I would come up with a story or a concept of this particular model. Uh, I found a place somewhere that I thought this scene, and I could see the scene, and then I would go and look till I find the right person for it. Mm -hmm. This is this girl, she, she just wanted to be a model, and I knew her dad, and he asked me if she would take a photo with her. And then I came up with this thing, and it just kind of happened that the cross in the back is actually from Pont Aven in France, that go to the church that Gauguin painted. So it's kind of it's, there's a lot of weird things in the shots. Chris, and how many how many guns do you own? I have none really, <laughs> but you know that one thing I was interesting. If you ask that, if you tell anybody in America, oh, I need a gun. <laughs> Arsenal coming your way. <laughs> I don't have to have one because they're everywhere. I mean, one guy drove up with his car and he had like the whole bank of his car filled with guns. And he would say, well, Which one do you want? Uh, it's like this array of guns. I have no clue about guns. It's just pick the most scenic one, I guess. And I grew up Catholic, so I'm still recovering in, from Switzerland. I'm very Catholic. And I had to go to Catholic school for a year. So I just wanted to get back at my old teachers, although they don't see the photos. So I did photos like this. It was really just for me, I, just to kind of, it's like an exorcism. And of course, um, again, American culture, the way they treat food, which is for, for a French person or for an Italian, a uh, very weird way of connecting with food. Uh, so that's why I figure she's kind of sprung, she's kind of just off and she had a hamburger sitting there. Um, and that was the idea behind it. Uh, it's respect for food. If I, I went to a fast food place to get this thing and I actually feel guilty of actually buying it and it stank up my whole studio. It was so bad. That's still the Earth series. Um, Bible and the gun, right? So, some of these I converted them later to book and write up, became like the outtakes of the American Dreamscape, which I called The Lost Highway. So, you know, like these images that kind of got away, they didn't make it in my book on the American Dreamscape, they didn't really work as well into the whole series. So, I 
took him out. And some of these are shot really quick, kind of like by hand or less elaborate. And uh, crucifix. Crucified woman. But the idea about this one was really she's a stripper in Portland um, that I, for some reason, found on Facebook. And then he would tell everybody Christian Heap is following Austin Wilde, a stripper. And that's when I found out that social media can kind of be deceiving. But so we, I put on the post that she looks like, uh, you know, Christ on the cross. Because to me, it's always like all these sex workers and strippers and all these women, they kind of get sacrificed for us men in a way. And they're basically, she has all these beat, you know, her beat up legs and all that. It's just, I'm just kind of like what's left of how we treat women. And I had it in a show in Switzerland, and one guy wanted to buy it. And then he saw the legs that they're not pretty. And then he said, Oh, well, no, with these legs, I'm not going to buy. It. So obviously, it didn't get my, my image. Same thing. Uh, you know, once you start photographing people, and you get into a certain, I get, you know, they got to know me then. So they knew me. And um, a lot of people knew I was safe and I always had assistance. I never, I would never shoot young women alone. So I always an assistant. If it's nude, I had a female assistant. I had my wife help. I had, if I knew the model, I had other assistants, but I would never go and shoot them alone. So then you get suddenly all these people who want to be photographed, right? So like these, I mean, it's the same girl again that we had with the gun and the cross just on the left, just above my friend. And the other is a the principal's uh, dollar. And That's I, an incredible painting in the background. <laughs> uh, David Cobb, the guy that's, you know, you know, David Cobb, he, I was with him in Baja and we walked through some touristy area in Cabo and he said, oh, look at that painting. I'm sure you like this. So I had to buy it. And then we hung it there. I saw a stage, right? That's in uh, Chimalt. We drove to a little place owned by an Indian family that's kind of a little motel. So we drove there and staged this scene. Uh, the Mohawk Diner, in one morning. I usually try to make the women stronger than the men, kind of. That's why I wanted him to be like a little boy. And she's kind of, she's more empowering than he is. Um, personal, that's a personal thing, but I think, look at my wife, I think women are usually in a way smarter and stronger than men. We, we may be stronger physically, but mentally we're not. Mm -hmm. So I try to do it. If women come out strong in my series because I was the boss, I could do what I wanted. And that's um, in Montana, there's a tiki bar in Great Falls. Uh, the Air Force base is there, so it's like one of the old tiki bars that people hair and butter in. And in the evening, they have mermaids swimming and jumping in in the pool. And I shot this in the morning because in the evening, there's so many people in it you can't photograph and so I put myself in and photoshop the mermaid in photograph the mermaid in, in at night in the evening and then photoshopped it all together. Yeah and this the tattoo parlor bend I got to know the owners and she the lady would always send model types my way because by then everybody in Bend would think to Christian he really had the thing for tattooed girls. Which was really just part of the series. I don't. I don't really like the tools at all. I, I, I don't. I think it's a waste of money, and I don't find them pretty. But for my series, they work so well. So I get all these tattooed people, and I get more and more. And people still point out uh, models to me in Bend, although I'm still done with this series. I mean, you know, it's finished. This is. Uh, yeah, just a stage in a trailer that I had. And some of them, I didn't really envision the photo like this. It just happened. I went out with them to take photos, and then they actually kind of spaced out. We were just sitting there smoking, and I shot it. This was totally staged. I mean, with all the lighting and uh, the system, the whole thing. I didn't know it by then, but he's a famous tattoo guy that uh, I guess everybody knows him, but at that point I had no clue who he was. 
Portland. It's the old neck of the woods. Same thing. It's the same stripper that we had with the, you know, with the lean on that satin sheet. She said she has a, she knows a guy that has a barber shop. She do something. So we just went there and this kind of happened. I'd spend my life asking if I really have some sick mind, but I didn't know either. This kind of, I wanted to get this scene out of the bridge with her. And I only met, I mean, the woman, she wanted to be photographed. She looked okay on Facebook. I didn't really know she had this huge press and playing with this dress. So it's just kind of, everything fell into place. I took a second shot. This is what while I was shooting the other one, I would shoot this with the other camera. When we were trying to get the right angle, and I would shoot the black and white, and this became the last movie. Just uh, we were shooting it from the down passing bend. That's the cabin of my neighbors. Um, same thing, it's the same little painting in the back, and another scene with. But the, the girl I've started the whole thing with. And that's a that's just a famous French photo of Jane Birkin mm -hmm. with another woman on a bed. Uh, I basically just took that photo and made it American. And then another woman was the other chance, so we put on the entrance. Then a little poltergeist feeling to it with the uh, TV. And after one girl left, I Took another photo of, uh, of this basically. But I envisioned people in Prime World or somewhere in the evening how they watch TV when they have a past blue ribbon. It's probably very mean and just my sick mind. But it's probably... And people told me, oh, it's just way too pretty for that. Let's see. It gets weird, though. Let me guys think. You can think whatever you want to think. So. The guys, my contractors, I used, he has all these old cars. So sometimes I just used people I knew. It's like the Bruce Springsteen song, Stolen Car. I don't know if that one. It's kind of sometimes a song that I wanted to put into a photo. Because Springsteen was I, one person that when, when I was living in Switzerland, did, you know, that kind of drew me to America. It's kind of like the plan of uh, smoke. And she was good because she was not a model at all. She was just, she would get lost in the world. So when I saw the girlfriend, she was just gone, which was perfect what I wanted. I sometimes even told the models, not to look sad, or, you know. Uh, I didn't want him to be just a pretty face. Sometimes I even told him it just doesn't work, it doesn't look good, so they actually became sad because they all want to be pretty, so. Yeah, sometimes you have to be kind of mean to get the photo, and then you can be nice again and build them up and tell them how great it was, how pretty they are. But if you tell them they're all pretty and it's all happy, then you get these stupid, happy photos that I can use for my mm -hmm. Right. So. This is kind of one of the only photos I actually I had this. I screened the photo from New Orleans that I had of uh, Oak Alley Plantation and then photographed the girl in the studio with the screen in the back. So and the only one I did like this. They told me in Bent that they used to go out to the countryside and they would on the crossroad, they would play music with their trucks and bands in the old days, you know, in Eastern Oregon. So I figured I'm going to stage it. The only problem in Bend is it's always cold and you always have freezing talent and models. Another one, I mean, this scene I've been thinking about a long time and then finally staged it. But I, the guy with the six pack, 
is the owner of the place that just happened to walk out of his K market at the right moment when all my lights were set. And I had to shoot at such a shot because I think it's actually kind of cool that he's standing there talking to the guy behind the muscle car. So I didn't really think that this is kind of a Tarantino scene. There's a horrible movie he did, some cheerleaders that you can't watch so bad. So that's where the idea came from. And that's my wife helping shoot it. So it's good. You know, it's got more elaborate and more lights and things. And I always wanted to impress people. So I, it's usually I'm too fast. So even my assistants, they're always kind of too close. So always the guy that runs over there and ch changes the lights. It's kind of frustrating to them. And kind of this house, Ben, uh, there's a lot of places that shot in Ben are not gone. Just one bit, just to work down here. Christian, what kind of music? Do you listen to? Oh, all kinds. I mean, I mean, if in the early days, I mean, except from the Eagles to BB King to Miles Davis to you know Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, you know everything. All the American music, some British. Well, a lot of these remind me of country music. Well, yeah, I love that too. Well, Johnny Cash. And I started as a kid, I started to listening to country music. Got message. And it's probably, yeah, I always have music. So Hank Williams. This I actually saw in Ben Van Grand Canyon driving back from a photo early morning sunrise. There was this. Suitcase laying there and all these clothes everywhere. And I guess somebody kicked his wife out, but I don't know what happened. So I just envisioned I recreated it, but put the girl in. Right? Funny man. This one uh, again was kind of staged through the painting. You don't really see it as well, but there's even a painting in the back in the room that I put in this specifically he loaned it from somebody. At the guy staring at the bunny. It's kind of surreal. Yeah, it's uh, in Redmond on the highway. Sometimes the light's just right, but the sky actually just broke in the right moment. I bought the dress for the woman, and she's got a sister of the tattoo parlor owner. That's my neighbor. I was walking past my house and it's, he was wearing this weird, weird sweater and he had an eye infection. So he had that uh, thing on his eyes so, and it's dark. So I staged it. And of course, my Indians, uh, the Ecosia Red Elk. Um, I think the first thing I photographed her in uh, Pendleton. And before that, she was giving yoga classes. So I found this place to photograph her. And then she said, what, what do you want me to do? And I told her, imagine you're an alien and you just landed here and you're in this country. And how would you feel if you'd be an alien and landed on this really weird planet? And that's what she looks like. And then the, her friend, the yoga, the yoga teacher was there and I just put her in the back as a kind of the contrast between that regalia and the yoga person. So it's kind of interesting. It's in uh, Rachel, Nevada. White uh, Little Falls. She actually stood up there and balanced with her heels. She um, Another bunny thing with the bunny slippers. It's always American cars in it. Where do you find all the where are you finding all the Cadillacs? Just there's a lot of people with cars like this. So once you you know, I went to car shows, talk to people, and 
there was a place in Redmond and the guy had a whole array of cars that he would sell and he had them all stacked up. So he would take some of his cars and then people know people with cars, guns, cars, guns, and interests are everywhere. Uh, you find models. Anyone, once you have, you know, when, once you get a reputation, people want to be in your photos and they'll come to you, which was kind of nice. Fine will again. Rick, the guy, the cowboy guy, I mean, he knows all these people. I just tell him I want some cheerleaders and then I'll come out and shoot something. And that's what he came up with. Uh, he knows everybody. So he would just line up people. Didn't know he would find the guy with the uh, injury, but it was kind of made the photo. That's in Nevada. Driving through Nevada, see these cowboys kind of, you know, roping a bull. And so I went to take photos of them and they invited me to the ranch. So I went to the ranch. There was this old farmhouse. It was just perfect. So we stayed there and we set this, this scene in the evening with our house and had this comic book kid coat with me that I put in his hand. And that was it. I kind of liked the little lawnmower and uh, Do you get model releases from all these people? Yeah, yeah, they all. It, always before I shoot, I have to sign the model release. But yeah, always. It's like that's never where I live. I arrested his dog on the highway that got away. I brought it over. I started talking, and I, he has cars everywhere. I mean, He's a car guy. She's the owner of my postal connection box. Well, I staged that. That was like stand your ground kind of thing. Christian, you could write a book for the NRA. It would sell like hotcakes. I know some people actually unfriended me for it. They didn't get it. It's it's really. The guns is just, I don't know making jokes of them. That's why I have the girls standing on that. I mean, for me, it was just ridiculous the amount of guns that are there. So some people actually like them. Some people thought I'm like a total gun nut. They actually like the photos because of the guns. Some people actually did get the joke, but some obviously not. You know, so it's really, I mean, you can think whatever you want to think. That's, it's kind of like, I don't want to tell people what they want to think about these images or about the photos. I initially didn't for me. It's really, I didn't really jump with any idea of showing them. I mean, they got published. We finally did a book and I had a couple of shows in Europe, but I really didn't just for me. And I always thought, you know, if, if, if they don't like it, they don't have a look at my photos. I don't, I don't really care. I mean, it's really my personal work. It's my photos. Mm -hmm. I'm not a gun nut, um, but if you, if you like and because of the gun, because of the tattooed women, I, you know, that's fine. So I, uh, after the, the dream stage, once it was done, because I was starting to repeat myself, that's another thing. I was starting to kind of do the same photo again. Um, I mean, I just I had more ideas, but they would be more of the same. So we finished, we were done. And then I cut myself as Uncle Sam. And we were traveling through the States to do, teach some workshop in the South, in Louisiana. And I would just pose myself in scenes like this. And it became my next series with kind of, in a way, sometimes stage like dream safe, sometimes it just happened. And this again, Rick, the cowboy guy. And this is the, it was, this is Photoshop because the photo I took when I took the stripper photos in Portland. And I came up again with all these America stuff, you know. Uh, I, I, I actually think your your pictures with guns make a statement about how crazy things are here. Uh, yes. I was suggesting, but there are people, as you said, who take it seriously, and the mm -hmm. NRA people are those. Yeah, that's yeah, you're right. I think so. But I don't know if they would get them all, but yeah, some people would kind of like them. But I think that there's plenty of that type of photos with that type of kind of 
a woman with uh, military garb and NL15. So I, I don't know, but maybe they would like them. I, I don't want to sell them those exactly, but well, if they want to buy them for a lot of money, I'll sell them. All right. So Christian, uh, do you feel like you know you're done with a project when you, you start realizing you're repeating yourself? Yeah, you know, when your wife tells you you're repeating yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But yeah, I mean, she was right. Usually, as I said, women are smaller than we are usually it's because she figured it out early. And I, I was really proud of one image and I showed her and said, well, isn't that kind of the same? And that's when I realized, yeah, I'm kind of doing it over and over again. And I, I guess, you know, I could go on, but it was so much work and I was like kind of obsessed for five years. And it's, it was just time to... Wait, I mean, I guess you have to know when you have to stop. Uh, it was kind of really good feeling to be done with it because I was scanning wherever I went. I was scanning for location. I was scanning for models. I saw a car somewhere. Oh, that'd be great to shoot. And so it, it was just so many evenings and so many times going out, schlepping all the gear, worrying about that the people did not show up. You know, these models are not really easy to paint. I mean, they, they want to be photographed, but that doesn't mean that they're on time. And the light doesn't wait, and all these things. Glad it's done, and I liked shooting myself because I was reliable. So I was there, which made it easy. And I shot myself in. Hey, Christian, when you show these photographs, especially, you know, like the other body of work, like to your European audience, I'm kind of curious is like what kind of feedback you get. But the feedback for the photos. Well, you know, like when they, when let's say, um, I don't know if you show in Germany or, or in even in Switzerland right now, it's an interesting time in Switzerland. When you show your work in, in, in various parts of Europe uh, of this Americana, what kind of comments do you get? It, it was, it's interesting, you know, in a way that Americans, got it much quicker that I was making fun of this thing. They got the joke, but a lot of the Europeans actually really didn't get it initially. I mean, a lot of them kind of thought I'm glorifying violence and, and weapons and had a harder time figuring out. And I, I mean, I got published in some of the magazines once they figured it out, but it was not, I, I thought it was actually easier here in the States, because you, you basically live with this craziness all the time. So you, it's probably, I don't know, I, I guess Americans did get it. Uh, Americans thought through it, which is funny actually. And the Europeans had a hard time adjusting. A lot of them really like, there's a type of person that loves America and Europe, and they would love the scenery of it, the old cars, the neon lighting, there's nostalgia of it. And in a way, also the guns and the tattooed women. So it's kind of, if you have a little base in Europe that didn't like the guns, they loved the photos. Said, well, if that wouldn't be, if there wouldn't be a gun in it, this would be such a great shot. That's something I love. But I said, the gun is the point because it's a great, otherwise, it's just a pinup shot. It's a pretty woman with a cat. Mm -hmm. With the neon glow, but if she doesn't have a gun or it's you know it's then it's not America. But so this is a personal project. Has any of this stuff been used for editorial purposes in magazines or I had yeah, there's some photo magazines in Germany and Switzerland, and I had a feature on a big travel magazine in Europe, and then we did a book on it. It's a copy mm -hmm. tape book, a very large one that we did. And some stock image sales, but it's not something that sells. I think I haven't really sold much for stock agencies, per se, but I had a couple of shows, too, and some publications. It, it wasn't really something that you would say it's, it made money, but it got mm -hmm. up, so I'm kind of okay with that. You know, it's not, I don't get 250,000 photo like Gregory Crutzen for his prints, so... <laughs> Well, the, it seems like you learned a lot doing this, especially with lighting. Did it change the way you approach some of your editorial work? 
Um, well, it, yeah, it, it was interesting. We had the studio for almost 11 years, 10 years. We had the center up there before we sold the building. But I, I kind of learned the lighting techniques for strobe lighting, outside lighting, and portraitures enough to actually make enough money just doing portraits and then all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. cool. um, we're kind of semi retired, so it's kind of pointless now to. Uh, mm -hmm. And I learned all this stuff because I'm not doing it anymore and I don't feel like doing it, but it's in commercial work in Ben. And as you probably all know, it's it's not really that much fun. So we basically just did a photo tours the last two years or three years. And most of my book publishers that they did on my books, they either went out of business or the pay is now so low that I'm not really you know, bothering to work with them much anymore. There's a few calendars, but it's it's kind of done. So I, I, personally, I think my career is kind of done, um, which is fine because we don't really, I, I still do a little bit of photography, but I kind of, I think I had my run. I don't know, you guys love photography, so it may sound weird, but I'm, at this point, I don't think I have to have a camera maybe in five years. Maybe I still want to photograph some birds here or something comes up that I really want to do, but I might as well not take photos, at least for a while, because I've done it for 30 years and I'm kind of tired of it. This stuff was fun, dude. I just, again, I think I ended doing things that I really liked for me and I always like doing my travel stuff but I know I write a lot of articles and I enjoy writing almost more than taking photos because it's it's new again it's something different I've been doing it for a long time but I always kind of dip on the sides now I can delve more into the actual writing and sometimes I need photos that go with my writing and it's kind of something I enjoy right now are you still doing workshops? Yeah, thanks to COVID, um, everything got pushed out for a couple of years. So we had some big, we go to New Zealand and uh, Australia finally next year for some photo tours, but that's been postponed for like three years. So three times my wife booked all the hotels for the whole group mm. and then canceled and rebooked. So we kind of finishing up the. Uh, we're finishing up the last tours that we have committed to do and then we may do one or two tours and then in like 16 months like 25 26 we're done we're, we're not going to do any more tours we have maybe section app for some other guys up in bend will do um some of the workshops for us psych already does most of the workshops um, that we have and um, but totally i'm probably not going to do them anymore I'll just come to photo uh, clubs and talk your era. <laughs> well, that's a good gig. Yeah, well, it's enjoyable. I mean, uh, <laughs> if, as long as you like what you're doing, that's perfect. Once it gets to kind of work or stressful or you're not feeling good about it, then why do it? You know, that's uh, right. like everything, right? You need to change or find something else, or maybe just take a break. Sometimes in photography, it's good to just have a break. I mean, we so hard, my wife and I, when we traveled, I mean, we were so tired sometimes of shooting a country for three months that it just felt good to have a weekend with not actually shooting. I think that's the last shot I have in there. That's from the last election when we did the sample sign on the, Salt Lake. Any other questions? Questions, anyone? Comments? So did you have somebody make this outfit for you or did you just find pieces that you put together? Uh, no, I had, uh, and there was a seamstress in Bend that I asked. And then she made it for me. I think she got the had all of that from someplace. Excuse <clears throat> me. And then I had the, the outfit made because I didn't want it to have one of these 
cheap, you know, Uncle Sam outfits that you can buy on Amazon. So I wanted something. Mm-hmm. So she built it and kind of made it for me. I may do just for kicks if we do a trip. We have one photo tour planned while we do cross country. It's like a month long tour from the Oregon coast to Boston by way of the Great Lakes. And I've it's for Europeans probably more, but the five Europeans already lined up. It's gonna be gonna be six people. And I'll probably bring the outfit with me because I may run into some scenes and things on that trip that I wanna get my costume out. So Christian, how long have you lived in the, the States now? Well, since 96. And okay. six, we came to the States for one and a half years to do my photography, the, the Indian thing. And I traveled all over. And those photos started my career in Europe, in Germany. In 86, 87 was here. But then for the next 10 years, every year we would spend five to six months in North America because I get all these assignments from the Europeans to go shoot America. So in the 90s, because it was so, I had so much work, I decided might as well move to the States because I'm here all the time anyway. So that's when we bought uh, the 40 acres in Bend and then built the house. And since then, we've been living in in Oregon. Of course, then 9-11 came and we, uh, nobody wanted to do books and stuff on North America for a while. So I went to all like, these other countries. We, went, we did all the Arabic countries, we did African countries, we did so many other countries on assignment for Europe, but living in the US. And then he came back and we did it US and a lot of other places, Central in South America, Mexico, and all that. But we've been here a long time. It's just because I'm married to a Swiss woman, my accent is still here. <laughs> well, I'm kind of curious. It's like I'm also an immigrant uh, to the States. And, you know, it's like I'm kind of curious. It's like, you know, like with your outsider's eyes, you know, like in, in uh, like 140 characters or less, is like, you know, like, what do you see here in the States as opposed or uh, contrasting to, you? Uh, and it's hard to generalize all of Europe because it's so varied, yeah. but, you know, like, what yeah. do you see here in the United States? Well, everybody probably sees something different, right? So for me, it was, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I mean, it's really the space and nature. I mean, for my arrival, me, we like the American people and we like the culture and we actually like felt comfortable being here, but I really came for the space and the untamed nature because that's what you don't have in Europe. You know, there's always been a Roman walking through that area already and cutting down all the trees and buildings and things that then fell down. So it's, you just can't find that amount of space and wildness than you could still find in North America. So that's really my main thing. And that's why I enjoy down here in Mexico and Baja as well. We kind of, the birds, the, the nature, the pristine desert, that kind of thing. Same as in Oregon, I have all the wildlife running through my yard. I'm kind of in the midst of nature. And it's really not that far to get to the Oregon coast and not that far to go to Yellowstone or you know, the Rocky Mountains. In Europe, I mean, I'm really close to Rome and I can go see the museums in Paris and yeah, the Swiss Alps I enjoy, but it's still, it's completely different landscape. I guess that's in Europe um, to find, uh, find that. How'd you end up in Bend? Uh, we, I did a travel guide on the Pacific Northwest for a German publisher, and we came to Bend. We, we kind of liked the closeness to the coast. We liked the high desert, the climate, and of course, the mountains. Being Swiss, we always have to have a mountain somewhere. So the mountains, and at that point, it was like 21,000 people. It was kind of small, and it just felt right because for what I've been doing it, for my publishers, a lot of the work was in the West United States, even California, San Francisco, I shot a lot. So Vegas, 
that was all nearby and it was it was actually a beautiful place the climate was great you know you still got some snow uh we didn't envision it to become like uh, the city that it is now which was kind of stupid but i guess it changed a lot and that's probably the other thing that since the 90s the united states and probably every country on the planet has changed dramatically so I think the country that I moved to in the 90s is not the same country today. So I don't know if I would still move here. I, I just can't say because I, I, my wife and I, we have now a little place in Switzerland that Regula got from her parents. So we'll we spend time in the Swiss Alps where we have a chalet. And it was interesting going back to Switzerland because I almost kind of envisioned Switzerland to be what it was when I left. And of course it's not, because now we know been like, oh, all these things in the States that piss me off. I mean, I like the guns and all that. I always envisioned and looked at Switzerland and thought, wow, oh, it's, you know, these things are so much better there. But then when you go back, I found that the place is totally different now. And I actually have the same things that piss me off, so to speak, in my old country that piss me off here. It may not be the guns, but it's other things. So you can't go back. It's like, you know, I, mean, I had a great childhood, but I, you know, it's awesome. Of course, I wanted to see Indians and go to America, but looking back, it was a great time. But you can't go back. So it's, it's a different country now. Are you going back? Dennis? I going back. Actually, yes. if Trump gets reelected, <laughs> seriously thinking about uh, moving back, I, you know, very seriously, like I'm from Latvia. Okay. Uh, and, you know, like I've already got my areas picked out. Okay. Well, it's, well, that's why we bought, I mean, we bought the place in Mexico here, like in 2004, when uh, George W. Bush got elected the second time. We bought property down here because I thought, you never know if we have to move out of the states quickly. Although, you know, so it, we're still there. But it's, 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 the problem is always you think it's going to be really bad here and you've got to move to another place. But I mean, you think you go to Sweden, it's liberal, it's all really nice and perfect. And then you realize how quickly it can change there too. And suddenly Sweden is a mess, which it is right now. So it's like, I, I sometimes feel that you can't run. Uh, I'd like to get something. There's certain moments when you have to run, like when the Nazis in Germany came to power and you're Jewish, it's probably a good time to leave. You know, I mean, there's certain moments when the country delves into an area where it's really not worth to stay there, but, you know, it changes. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't think the US. Certain areas I wouldn't want to live in the US. Um, I still want to live in Oregon, partially. But who knows? I mean, any place can go. You go back to Latvia and the Russians invade, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're you, done you that. Putin, you got Putin to worry about. Yeah. It's always something to worry about. It's like, you know, it's, uh, the, the perfect place does not exist. I mean, it may exist for a while, and then you better enjoy it. And you know, keep your eyes open and uh, do that. I, don't worry, Trump's not going to get reelected. So I have another question. I uh, came from a, a commercial background um, and quite a bit of editorial also, and did a bunch of books. And if you were to advise, because like people ask me, uh, you know, like if you were a young photographer or a young photographer came to you. For advice about how to start a photography business, what would you tell them? Don't. <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, that's kind of. I mean, like I get these questions all. I mean, all the time, but often, and I think it's all marketing. So yeah. photography is actually besides the point. It's really, it's it's all about marketing because now you can create any photo out of nothing anyway. So you don't even have to have good light. You don't even have to be very good. You have to be good on the computer and you can create anything. And it's all about how you market yourself. I don't know if the money is really in the photography. I mean, you could still do commercial photography and build a career, I don't know, doing something, you know, fashion photography, whatever. 
but I think it's probably more computer, just become a computer whiz of creating things. And photography in the sense of nature photographer or travel photographer, all that stuff, I think that's kind of, it's probably not a, something I would recommend doing. And I can be totally wrong, but I, I would do it as a hobby if you want to. But even as a hobby, I think it's starting to kind of get annoying because you can do something really creative, maybe or do you know your really own special thing, but just go out and shoot waterfalls or do calendar photos, all of those things. Now we're changing the sky, we're changing the lighting. It's kind of besides the point to waiting two days to get the perfect shot because you can do it in your computer in five minutes. Is that one of the reasons that you feel like it's time for you to move on to something else like writing? Is uh, that part of it? Yeah, that's part of it too. Um, but I mean, as I said, I, I did all the things that I wanted to do. I mean, my wife and I were basically, as you know, what do you want to see? Other places you still want to see on the planet, do again. And we kind of get this blank look and we think, well, should we really want to go back to you know, what Telesca, whatever? I think, well, we've been to all these places. It was a great time. I don't really feel, and she doesn't feel like we need to do anything. We just like to be home. We really enjoyed the COVID time because you know, we spent a year almost at home. Or here we've been five, four, five months in Mexico and we don't have to do anything. So we really enjoy all that. And the market is one thing. I mean, I could probably still push and I, could, I still make money with some photos. Um, but we, it, it's, it's the thing. I don't, if you don't have to work, if you, if you have enough money at this point that you don't have to make money, then why do it? You only do it because you either um, like money too much or your ego doesn't let you. That's, I think that's one of the other things, the ego thing to be relevant. A lot of people want to stay relevant. You know, Diane Feinstein is a perfect example. I mean, why in the world do you want to be in the Senate at that age? I mean, it's like, why would you do that? There's a lot of people that can't let go. Art Wolf, I guess he loves what he's doing and he did all his tremendous work but that, do we really have to have Art Wolf still doing stuff? Do the younger people doing it? And it's like, why can't they just stop and be Art Wolf, but not the photographer? I guess it's that what he is. He's Art Wolf, the, the uber photographer. So, and I never wanted to be that. So I'm kind of, I'm happy. I, I can just go and forget about all these things and enjoy life. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to have to be life of the camera. No. Yeah, you have to either be doing it for the money or for the love. And when those things right. aren't there. But, yeah, I still, you know, I mean, the problem is I'm still the guy. I, mean, I still have two cameras here in, in my house in Mexico. And I mean, every once in a while, the light out there just breaks perfect. Although I shot it like a trillion times and I definitely don't need a photo whatever sunset over Ventana Bay, but the light is so good, I, I'm still up there and take the photo and I still take photos of the birds because when the red cardinal just sits right, I just shoot it. Although I, I really don't need it, but that's I do just because I like doing that. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy if I have friends over and the light is really perfect and I'm not going to get up and take the photo because at that point, I, just, I don't need the shot. So I'd rather be with my friends. I don't want to you know, and now everybody will meet a guy with the camera I did that for years. I was the guy that's doing happy hour in Africa, sometimes running around with the camera, shooting, 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 and never shuts up. So, <laughs> so you mentioned writing. Uh, are you uh, wanting to do writing about photography or are you thinking about fiction? No, I write blogs I, I write for some of the travel magazines i write travel stories kind of mm -hmm. i wrote a memoir which is how i became an american how i came to the united states and all my travel stuff and photography with it so it's kind of like a mixture i write a lot of blogs on certain aspects of travel with some photography 
I, I'm, I'm kind of bored with the aspects of technical photography. I'm not a, a, I'm not that incredible photographer, really, in terms of techniques and stuff. I'm still, you know, that's not my thing. So I'm, I'm not a good person to write about these things, but I write, I'd, I'd like to write about experiences, you know, about the natural world, about experiences with people, make interesting stories, things that I saw. Uh, I don't want to write a, a big fiction book. I just write, like to write about, I even, you know, um, some things about Mexico, about, I, I write a lot of, to my European clients, you know, where once in a while about our life in America or in Mexico. And then I like fun about myself and about the people I live with, about the little weird things that Mexicans do and Mexican dogs and about myself and about the weirdness of my existence and all these things. I kind of enjoy doing that. And some of my, some people enjoy reading them. And it's kind of rewarding. It's fun. It's different. It's different from the picture. Mm -hmm. So Christian is um, like in 20, 30, 40 years, when you kind of uh, pass over the horizon, have you thought about like, or have you made arrangements? Like what's going to happen with your work? your body of, of work, your, I don't know, like if you still have like film or yeah. all of them or digital files, whatever, what do you, what, what's going to happen with those? Have you made those kind of arrangements? At this point, I have no clue. I mean, I, I, because I have so many slides, I tossed uh, probably 80% of my archive I threw away. I, I scanned like 30,000 images that I have. And I really, I don't even care much about my legacy in that sense, about the images. I don't really know. Maybe in 10 years or 20 years, I think, well, maybe it'd be nice to at least have 500 of my Native American images preserved somewhere. But being such a fatalistic person, I don't really care. It's like, there's so many images. The other thing why I find probably not as rewarding, but there's so many photos out there that I, you know, I, I think it's actually more important to have more pristine forests left and more uh, interesting creatures out in nature than my stupid photographs of some tattoo. <laughs> it's really, I think it's pointless. I mean, there may be, I have a few images of some Native Americans, some of them passed away, some old chiefs or some persons that are kind of a document, a time document. Those I probably should see what I want to do with them, or I don't know, like George Kicking Woman, the Blackfeet Elder, some people in Montana that may be worth preserving. But most of my images, I mean, the travel photos, there's like <laughs> landscapes of arches, and you know, that's, it's all really, there's no value to all that. <laughs> Christian, Christian yeah. you've traveled all over the world. Is there anywhere? that you haven't been to that you would like to go? No. Uh, next year we do the great rainforest up in, in uh, British Columbia, the, you know, Komodi Bear area. That's something my wife always wanted to do. We're going to do that because that's just for the joy of it. Other than that, I don't really have a place that I want to go. It's, it's, it's I'm a very shallow person. It's, <laughs> I'm, I don't really have to see the whole world. That's the other thing. It's like this. I give me this list of all these places. I get some of my clients that come to my tours. They kind of go, they have like this list and they go through these lists. And they have one guy has like one photo tour a month all over the world to go to all these places. And I just don't get that. It's like, I did, we did like 90 countries, and I think that's almost too much. It's plenty of places. And if you just want to go to these places, so I have a photo, so you can say, well, I've been to this. I don't want to go to Antarctica. I mean, that's one of the things you, people want to go to Antarctica. And like, yeah, you get, you, first you hit the penguins, take photos of the penguins that everybody else did, and then you shoot a lot of ice, and then you go back. It's like, I just, I, I don't see the point. I, I never saw the point. I never did Eastern Europe. I never went to uh, Russia. I mean, a lot of places I haven't been to. I mean, we did China, we did Vietnam, and all these places, but I don't really, 
think you have to fulfill the list. It's not when you die that there's this guy up there and then wants to check your list if you finished all your countries, you know. But you've, been, you've, anyway. you've been to Japan, right? You've been to Japan? No, only to Tokyo when we flew through. I haven't done Tokyo. Yeah, I haven't done Japan. I have, I'm a little biased towards Asia because there's too many people. They're really nice people, but it's just so crowded. And I, I tend to go to places like Patagonia or Southern Africa, places out of space. I don't like crowds. Vietnam was horrible. It's just people everywhere. So someone asked a question in the chat. Is there any U.S. movie you would recommend for your European friends for the look and style of the High Plains modern U.S. West? A movie for the, for the U.S. West? The uh, High Plains, modern U.S. West. Jesus. Is there a movie on the High Plains, U.S. West that's kind of accurate? I would have to think hard on that. Well, you can get back to us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean there's a lot of movies, but movies usually are not very accurate in what they're depicting. So it's like that we have a movie that won all the awards. It's actually, down in New Zealand, they filmed it in New Zealand. And it's supposed to be Montana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to think about it. There's a lot of good movies about in the, you know about the U.S., but the U.S. West. Well, are there any movies that you, in, in general, about the U.S. That you recommend to European friends to have an accurate depiction of the U.S. I could I could send you off a list of a few. That's probably easy. I mean, I like the Ice Storm. Mm -hmm. Coast. The Ice Storm is one of my favorite movies. But other than Blue, well, they're all good movies. I like Pulp Fiction too. It's one of the few Tarantino movies I actually liked. Mm -hmm. That time period, I think it was perfect. Does anybody else have questions for Christian? Well, Palo Highway was really good if you're Native America. That's kind of like Palo Highway is really good. I send you I send you this. Yeah, send that to Bob and he can share it with us. Okay. We'll do. Well, All right. Thank you. Kind of feels like we're done. Thanks for taking the time to share your photos with us and kind of give us a backstory on a lot of those. It was really interesting. And I think it's well, a pretty cool project. Right. Thank you for having me. I have one more question, if if I could, Christian. Sure. So, like, you know, looks like you're working mostly in projects. How do you uh, stay focused on like uh, like one project and how do you keep like the variety from you know one shoot to the next uh, shoot how do you keep like uh, like the ideas flowing for that project uh, well I kind of I don't really stay focused on one project <laughs> That, I mean, that's always, I think, I think Billy Cobb had a good, we, we did a thing on the business of photography 10 years ago, and he would say, you, you know, find your niche, and then you work that niche, and this is like your little box that you are good at, and this is, marketing terms, your area of expertise. I'm like the opposite. I'm the guy that does too many things, so too many ideas, and does everything. And out of that whole mess that's coming out of all this, I pick out certain projects and I stay with certain, but some will get discarded. So I started tons of projects. I mean, out of the dreamscapes, I had like two or three spin-offs that I didn't finish, that I started because this, the, in the end, I had to clean it out and put these, these on the American dreamscapes and I got the last hiring and all the, some other things I just discarded. But while I was shooting that, I was shooting commercial event, I was shooting calendars, I would go down to Vegas to photograph a calendar of 
magazine story and while shooting the magazine story i walk into this place that's perfect dreamscape so i would stage a dreamscape right there and get the shot for the dreamscape so i i did all this simultaneously and with these projects in mind and i i used to have for years i had tons of ideas about coffee table books you know different things i would shoot for a book on peru i would shoot peru but in the back of my mind i had a book on Inca culture or native culture. So I would shoot out of natives and kind of with the concept for the native book in mind. So I would shoot different uh, projects all the time or for different magazines. I would shoot the same scene or the same destination two or three different ways because I knew the French really liked to have certain types of images. So I would shoot things that I knew my agency in Paris would like. For our clients, but I would shoot differently for the Germans. I had that in the back of my mind all the time. So I would shoot differently. I'd take more photos because I also know magazines. Sometimes you have to have more space, you know, more copy space for an image. So I would shoot an image with a lot of copy space because that goes to my agents. They could sell it for this. But then for my book publisher, I would shoot another image that I knew that's going to go in a book. So you, keep, you have to keep all these things moving and then pick them apart later. But as a different personality, as like Gregory Crutzen, I mean, that's, I really like his work and inspire me a lot for my American dream state. But now he keeps shooting the same thing. And it's just one image after another. It's the same thing. They're getting better technically. They're really perfect. He has a whole crew. He has, I don't know, 20 people working on his photos. But I mean, he keeps doing the same thing. So, and he's so focused on just one thing, which I can't. But it's our personality, I guess. All right. Well, that was a good way to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks again, Christian. Really appreciate it. Enjoy well, the nice well, well, Thank you, guys. Nice meeting you all. All right. Everybody, take care. Good. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.